So thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Foundation in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Laura Wright. I'm the Assistant Director for Metadata Production at the Cornell University Library and also the convener of the Metadata Management SIG and the host for today's event. Our topic today is data import and data export. Today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Foundation's YouTube channel. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted. We have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in this topic. Please use the question box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. The speakers will address the questions at the end of the presentation, though if there's something that seems urgent, I may take host prerogative and jump in with it. Um, if you like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum, but please know we may not see your comments there during the forum. We also encourage you to consider to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio Discussion website. That's discuss.folio.org. Our speakers today are Anne Marie Bro and Magda Zacharska, both from EBSCO, and I'm going to turn it over to them. All right. Thanks, Laura. Um, this is Anne Marie. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so give me just a second here. And I will get the PowerPoint going. And uh, quickly, um, we're going to do just a quick introduction to ourselves, and then we will um, get started. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Anne Marie Bro, and I've been a uh, tech services librarian for my whole career. I started out at Harvard as an acquisitions librarian, and that's definitely my passion. Um, I've done a fair bit of cataloging along the way as well. And after that, I moved to YBP Library Services, now known as GOBI. Um, there, I was uh, heavily involved in um, helping libraries connect their local systems to GOBI and the different services from YBP for workflows. And a few years ago, I um, switched over to uh, our parent company, EBSCO, and am now working as a product owner on the Folio project. Um, I am product owner for Data Import, which is the, the uh, part of this meeting. I also handle the tags functionality. And then Dennis Bridges is the primary product owner, but I help out a lot with acquisitions uh, apps as well. So that's my background and Magda. Hello, ev <clears throat> Hello everyone. This is Magda Zaharska and uh, my professional career splits almost evenly between being a librarian and working in software development as a software developer uh, or tester. I worked for more than 10 years uh, in the acquisition department and then in the research department of the Jagiellonian Library in Krakow, Poland, uh, then followed by three years at, as a serial cataloger in uh, Hillman Library at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, working at uh, Hillman it encouraged me to go into the software and uh, software development and learn about how the big uh, systems are being built. After uh, several years working uh, in different industry, in 2012 I joined EBSCO and in 2017 I joined Folio as a software developer in test. At the beginning of this year I transitioned to the product owner role. Um, my responsibilities include SIP2 and title level request. And starting in August, I venture into data export. Thank you. I've lost my unmute for a minute. Sorry about that. 
Um, so both Magda and I mentioned product owner. I just want to take a minute to explain that um, in case there are folks who are not uh, aware of that position. So with the Folio community and with the development work, we have various roles that, that are involved in trying to make Folio come to life. Um, the most important part of the community are the, what we call them SMEs sometimes, the subject matter experts, the librarians and library staff who are involved with different product areas and different functional areas. And then we have designers who are the people that put together wireframes and um, uh, pictures of what the screens would look like and how they would act. And we have the developers who actually uh, do all of the coding to make this come to life. The product owner sits in the middle of all of that and so takes input from the librarians and the library staff, um, works with the designers to come up with uh, screens and uh, actions on those screens that will uh, carry out what the requirements are and then writes that up into stories for the developers to produce. So that's Magda's and my roles uh, right now for a few different areas of Folio. So for today, we are planning, if I can make my screen change, uh, we've done our introductions. I want to spend just a few minutes on folio inventory because that's a really important piece for both data import and data export. And uh, so I want to take a couple minutes to show some possibilities there. And it's a, a little bit different structure than folks might have had in, in previous library systems. Um, then I'll show a bit about data import and we'll go live and see a bit of a demo and then Magda is going to talk about data export, which uh, has been uh, getting started in a big way in the last last couple of months with Magda's guidance. And then, of course, there'll be time at the end for for questions. So with inventory, one of the things that we wanted to do with Folio is make it so that it was format agnostic when it comes to bibliographic metadata. You don't have to have MARC to work with Folio, but you can use MARC. You will also be able to use other metadata formats besides MARC. But basically, in terms of, of metadata, this is all that you need to be able to run Folio. There is no mention of mark on this screen. Um, there is only this thing called inventory. And within inventory, we have currently three types of records, instances, holdings, and items, and will at some point have containers as well. Instances are what you traditionally think of as bibliographic records uh, in, in a uh, traditional catalog. Holdings is where you would see location and call number information. And then items are the things that usually you'll think of as item records that have the barcode numbers, let you keep track of individual copies and circulate them. So nothing fancy, um, but by having inventory and by having a structure that doesn't rely on MARC, it allows us to uh, do some things that are beyond standard MARC. So being able to support multiple different metadata formats, being able to have uh, brief records that aren't necessarily in MARC. Most of the staff, other than catalogers, this is the closest they're going to get to bibliographic metadata in Folio. And so that means circulation folks and acquisition folks don't necessarily have to talk MARC. They just have to be able to talk in the inventory formats. The inventory records are in JSON format and they can be created by hand in inventory or they can be derived from underlying um, more complete metadata records. So if I were running Folio, this would be all that I would have to have to be able to run the bibliographic portion of Folio. There are going to be some other choices that some libraries make, and this is an example from Chalmers, which is the first library that has implemented Folio. And for them, their main source of bibliographic metadata is actually a union catalog outside of Folio called Libris, a, a Swedish catalog. 
and they are deriving brief versions of instances that they're loading into inventory. But when it comes to things like the full subject headings and, and all the um, added entries and all the notes, that stuff is living up in Libris, not in inventory. So they're basically bringing in enough to be able to drive the staff functions of Folio, but not all of the discovery uh, that, a, that an end user would need. That information is living up in Libris and is displaying in discovery, but not in Folio itself. And when they are cataloging or when they're editing records, they're actually editing the metadata up in Libris, <clears throat> excuse me, not in Folio. So Libris is their source of truth for bibliographic metadata and uh, the inventory in Folio is their source of truth for holdings and items. This structure is what we think a lot of libraries will be using in Folio, and this is the first time you're seeing Mark on the screen. So with the um, uh, inventory, you still have the same inventory, but underneath the inventory, you have this thing called source record storage. And I think of source record storage as kind of a hotel where all of the records in their original formats uh, are living. So we've We've built the mark wing of source record storage. Um, still to be constructed would be things like the bib frame wing or the Dublin wing, <clears throat> places where you can store records in their original formats and where they can be accessible to editors where you need to be able to have the mark detail. So the first editor that's part of Folio is MarkCat, where you'll be able to edit your mark bibliographic holdings and authority records. When there is an underlying source record, the instance data, like the title, is not editable in inventory because it's being derived from the source, the 245 in the source mark record that's living underneath the instance. So source record does not have a little person because it's not a user facing portion of Folio. I can interact with records in inventory and I can interact with records in MarkCat and any creates or changes that I do in MarkCat flow to source record storage and also surface in inventory. So this structure we think is gonna be a structure that a lot of the folio libraries will use, but the other structures that I showed you in the other screens are equally valid and it all depends on what your particular library wants to do. Just to mention a couple things about the data import subgroup. So we are part of the metadata management SIG and there's a link here in the slides to our homepage under MM SIG. There you can find notes for all of our meetings, the many use cases that we gather at a while back. Um, there's also a Google Drive folder that has a lot of our documents and uh, we sometimes end up with posts on discuss there's a lot more that happens on the Slack channels these days than in Discuss. So these are where a lot of the active day-to-day -day stuff is happening. So when we first started working on data import about a year and a half ago now, I would say, um, we spent some time talking about what are the places where you get records. And I'm gonna mute for one second. Okay. So we looked at when you are getting files of records that you want to import, where are they coming from? What types of records are they? How are you getting them? What are you using them for? And these were some of the important stats that we came up with. Um, many of the records are coming from the same places that libraries are purchasing materials from. So book providers, e-resource content providers, um, and these are either cataloging records or invoices or acquisitions records that go along with that material. Some of the records are coming from places that only supply records. So places like OCLC or authority vendors that you're working with um, where you're exchanging records of, of some type or another. When we looked at what kinds of records people are receiving and uh, tried to figure out what are the most important, 
MARC bibliographic records are doing a, an amazing amount of work carrying around not only bibliographic data, but also holdings and items, order data, invoice data. Um, so clearly MARC bibliographic records were where we needed to start. A lot of libraries also receive Edifact invoices, and so we need to make sure that we can import those invoices. Um, there are libraries that, that still work with MARC holdings and will be continuing to use those in Folio, so we want to make sure that we can work with those. Obviously, MARC authority records and delimited files, um, often some of the um, uh, some of some vendors will send things like order uh, confirmations or invoice data in an Excel file or in a delimited file that needs to be um, parsed and and entered. When it comes to delivery method, it was kind of all over the place. So one of the decisions that we made to kind of limit the scope at the beginning was to make it so that we were going to assume that you've already picked up the file somewhere and the file is now sitting on your drive, uh, on your local drive or on a shared drive, someplace that you can just grab it and stick it into Folio instead of trying to build a go out and grab the file or build a scheduler of some kind. Come on. So this is why we started with the Mark Bibliographic Record. Um, like I said, it can often carry information for other types of records as well. So what we're imagining when you import a Mark Bibliographic Record at its most complete, um, so a good example might be an approval plan purchase where you're getting the materials and the cataloging and the shelf ready data and the invoicing all at once, or maybe shelf ready purchases uh, where you're getting, you placed an order and now you're getting the cataloging and the invoicing data. All of that may come in a MARC bibliographic record. That record is going to load to the source record storage. It's going to get copied to MarkCat so that it's available for um, the richer, uh, more detailed editing if you need to do that at some point. And then pieces of it are going to get broken apart and uh, turned into the instance record. We have a default fil um, mapper that takes data from MARC fields and, and puts it into the appropriate instance fields. Some of it may get used to build a holdings record, like the call number or the location, for example. Some of it may get used to build the item record. Best things there tend to be things like barcode numbers, maybe copy numbers. Um, some of it will get used to build the order record, so the fund and the price and the quantity. And some of it may get used to build the invoice record, so the vendor invoice number, invoice date, final price, final quantity. So by loading one bibliographic record, you would be able to affect multiple apps and multiple types of records in Folio. Some libraries, if, if they're not choosing to store the MARC record <clears throat> in Folio, they may choose to harvest all of that information and build the various things in inventory and acquisitions, and then at the end, throw away the MARC bibliographic record instead of storing it in source record storage. That's totally fine. It's, it's again, this is totally up to what the library wants to do. And because Folio is not MARC dependent, you can use MARC to uh, transmit information and to gather information from, but you don't have to store it in MARC format unless you want to. MARC holdings, we have not started importing yet, but when we do, which will be in the, in the next quarter, um, they would get loaded to source record storage. They would create the inventory holdings record, again, based on a default map from the MARC to the inventory holdings format. And they would be copied into MarkCat so that they could be edited uh, within, within Folio. Just like with uh, bibliographic data, if you imported data through Mark Holdings, but you didn't want to store it in Mark Holdings, you just wanted to store it in inventory, you could choose to discard the Mark Holdings after you had harvested the data from it. 
And for MARC authority records, right now there is no way that they surface in inventory. The, uh, how authority work and how authority details will show in inventory is still being sorted out. So if I were to load MARC authority records, they would get stored in source record storage and they would surface in MARC CAT for people to uh, work with and edit. When I load an EDIFACT invoice, it will create acquisitions records, uh, sorry, acquisitions invoice records. Those will be tied to the individual orders that the, the invoice payments are for. And the invoicing also allows for adjustments and uh, charges that are not, not part of individual um, title purchases to be included as part of the invoice data. This part, the invoice part of Folio, is the part that Acquisitions is building out um, big time right now. The invoice is mostly there. The transactions, which tie the, the um, money on the invoice to the money in the library's funds, are just now being, um, being finished up. So this is kind of the picture I showed you a few minutes ago, but with orders and invoices added to the end. And this is just a, a way to show you again how source record storage relates to inventory and mark cat. Um, if there is a mark bibliographic record stored, it will influence what shows in the instance. When I am looking at the instance in folio, most of that instance will not be editable because it's being controlled by the underlying mark bib. Same thing with mark holdings. If I have an underlying mark holdings, I will not be able to edit the pieces of the inventory holdings record that are controlled by the underlying source mark holdings. There is no equivalent for uh, mark item records. So inventory, everything in the item record will continue to be editable. On the mark cat side, it's a two-way relationship. So the, um, the mark cat is not just a recipient of information the way that inventory is. Um, if information flows into source record storage, it will flow and synchronize to MarkCat. On the other hand, if someone is creating records or editing records in MarkCat, when those are saved, that information will flow and update the source record. And then in turn, that will update the instance or the holdings. And then the order and invoice are kind of sitting here on the side because they will be affected by input import, but they don't receive the ongoing bibliographic type updates the way that um, the bibliographic areas do. So that's a layout of the um, inventory area and how source record storage and mark cat fits with it. Um, data import is how a lot of that data is going to get into the system and it interacts mostly with source record storage as a starting point but then it branches out to many other apps in folio we'll look at it live in just a couple minutes but i wanted to give you just a basic outline of of what goes into the import process so it all starts with uploading a file and we'll do that in just a couple minutes and once the file is uploaded, it, uh, it gets assigned a job, and that job is going to dictate what actually happens with that file once it's been loaded. The job can have a number of components, and so instead of having to create new jobs um, and, and uh, uh, input those same components over and over again, we decided to kind of make it like Legos, where you would have smaller components that you could put together into jobs. So those components are match rules. I might be matching often on maybe the, uh, the UUID or the, the record ID for the instance or the purchase order number. Um, and I expect that purchase order number to be in maybe a 935 or I might be matching on an ISBN. And so often I may be using the same type of match rules from one job to another. So now I can create a little match profile that says, look for the purchase order number in 935 subfield A and compare that to the purchase order line number in the purchase order in folio. And then I can reuse that same match profile over and over again in different jobs. 
Likewise, we have action rules. So I may be creating new records in Folio. I might be creating an instance or creating an item record. I might be updating them. And when I update them, there's two different ways I can update. One would be to merge. So I keep some of the existing data that's already in the record in Folio, and then I add record from the incoming, or, sorry, add data from the incoming record. Or I might be overlaying. Maybe I have a brief ugly bib in Folio right now because it was an all caps, um, no subfields, messy little record. And I just want to wipe it out and totally replace it with my beautiful new cataloging data that's coming in. We will have support for deletes as well. Um, deletes are more complicated than any of the other types of actions just because they have a lot more implications. So we're focusing on getting data in to Folio to start with, and then we're gonna work on the delete part. And the last piece of the job profiles is mapping rules. So if I am bringing in a MARC record and I have a bunch of order data in a 980 in various subfields, how do I know which subfield has the price, which subfield has the quantity or the fund or the location? The mapping rules are going to help me know those subfields, plus what are defaults that are maybe not in the uh, incoming record at all, but that I would need to add to be able to finish creating an order record or creating an item record. So my file gets matched up with a job. The uh, user presses a button to say, go to work. And at that point, it starts, uh, the, the uh, data import app starts talking to a lot of other apps in Folio. There's a model called PubSub, Publish and Subscribe where the other apps will be alerted that um, we need to do, or we need inventory to do something. We need the orders app to do something. Orders app will take the data that's being supplied from data import and create the order or create the invoice. Um, inventory might be creating uh, the instance or updating the holdings or the item. Um, in source record storage and mark cat. If I'm saving the mark record, then I'm loading that up and uh, storing that as well. Once all of that work has been done, then everything reports back to data import and that allows us to produce a load report or a log that shows what all happened. Um, did everything work the way it was supposed to? Did we run into problems because uh, there was an invalid fund or you didn't supply a barcode, num barcode number, um, something that, that caused a problem in the process of trying to create or update a record. So that's the background slides. Um, I wanna take a few minutes to go through the, uh, the same thing that we're looking at now, but live. And so I'm gonna flip over to Folio. And Laura, can you confirm you're seeing my folio screen? Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay, so I'm on uh, one of the, we call them hosted reference environments, which is Folio Snapshot Load. Um, if you have played with Folio, you might have been playing with Folio Testing or Folio Snapshot, Folio Snapshot Stable. Folio Snapshot Load is a place where we can load large files and not run the risk of, of bogging down Folio Snapshot or Folio Testing for, for other apps. So this is our own little playground we can use for data import. And just like with all of Folio, the apps that a particular user has access to are arrayed across the top. And then I have all the other apps that don't fit on the top in my drop-down menu. And I'm logged on as myself in this case. Um, <clears throat> often you'll see DQ admin is the, the kind of standard log on. But I wanted to use a different one just to be able to show you some, some variety in the screens. So the important places in data import are the, the data import app itself and the um, a settings area. And so I want to go to data import first. 
And this is what we call the landing page of data import. So when you first opened the app, this is sample data. So when you are looking at Folio data import in your own area, you'll see um, different, uh, you, you probably won't see anything in the jobs area. You may or may not have files in, that have been loaded. Uh, and once you start loading, you'll have lots of files. But, and then there's this drag and drop area on the right hand side where you can start to upload new files. I'm going to pretty much ignore the left hand pane for right now. Um, Preview is not yet functional, but it's going to give you a way to, to look at what's going to happen before you commit and save the final results. The logs area in the middle is where you can see on the landing page the most recent 25 jobs that have been imported. And so, uh, so these are the most recent jobs that we have. And if I scroll over, I can see what job profile was used to load the job, how many records were in the file, when did it finish running, and who ran the job. So there's some that I've run and there's some that DQ has run. We only show the most recent 25 logs here. So if I want to see further back than that, I can hit view all and it will show me all the logs back to number one. Um, on these demo sites, everything refreshes overnight, so you never have very far back. Um, but in your own environments, you would have all the way back to the beginning. And I can search on a file name. Um, if I put a star, it does a contains type search. Whoops, if I actually do a star. So I can get any of the file names that have ebook in the file name. I can also filter by were there errors in the import or not, by the date that the import was done, which is not very exciting on these demo accounts because everything has the same date, by the job profile that was used. So if I just wanted to see the ones that were, we call this extract, transform, load. And again, you decide what the names of these profiles are. I could say, show me only the jobs that used that particular profile and just pull up those particular jobs? Or what are the jobs that a particular user did? So if I just wanted to see the ones that I had done, I can filter it down to just those. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go back to the home page and I'm gonna load a file. Before I do that, I just wanna show it to you in Mark Edit. So this is a, a little file of records, um, beautiful mark cataloging records. Down here is where things start to get interesting. So I've got, this is a, an innovative purchase order number, and then the 940 and 949 have information that might be used to build an item record. The 980 has invoice information. So, Currently, we are only acting on inventory instances, but this is the type of file that I would expect to be able to load and create or update the instance, holdings, item. Uh, probably the order already exists, and then I would want to create the invoice. So I'm going to load this file, and to load it, all I have to do is drag and drop. Um, when I start to load it, it will bring me to another page. We call this the Choose Jobs screen. And I can pick any of my MARC related job profiles. So it knows because of the MRC um, file extension to restrict my job profiles to just the ones that know how to handle MARC profiles. And I could pick load shelf ready cataloging records perhaps. This shows me a little overview of the job and I'm, I'm missing the section that shows me all of the match and action information. Um, I would be matching in this case on the purchase order number that was in the 935, I think it was. And my actions would be updating the instances, holdings, items, and not touching the orders, but then creating invoices and updating the MARC bibliographic record. When I hit run, it runs the job and it, <clears throat> excuse me, takes me back to the home page. 
And once the file has run, it puts it at the top of my log list and it shows me the job profile that was used, the number of records in the file, so 110, and who ran the job. If I look at the details of the current log, which is not our final version of the log, it's going to show me all of the mark records that are in the file. And so if I scoot down to the 245, nope, this is not my file. Hang on. Cat plus bronze, that's the one I want. All right, maybe it is my file and I picked a different one from last time. All right, so I'm just gonna grab my vertebrates title here. And now I'm gonna go over to inventory. And in inventory, I'm gonna search for that title. This title did not exist in inventory before I loaded the mark file. And so now this title is an instance in inventory. I did not create the holdings or item. That's a piece that we're still working on building, but it has created the instance and it has created the instance based on the default map that we have that says take data out of this particular mark field and put it into this particular field of the instance record. So for example, O2O subfield A loads as ISBN resource identifier type and then here's the data that came from the O2OA. Um, we can recognize personal versus corporate versus conference names. I'm trying to see if there's anything exciting, like some notes. So we have a 504 a bibliography note. So all of this default mapping is happening behind the scenes. Um, libraries can control whether they want information to show up and if they wanted to show up in perhaps a different field from what the default map is. But we wanted to make sure we had something that we could send out as part of Folio um, so that you, you weren't starting from nothing. Uh, it might be if I'm not a Dewey library, I'm, I might not wanna show potential Dewey classifications in, in my uh, inventory instance. Always keep in mind, this is what the staff is seeing though. This is not what your, your users are seeing. Anne Marie, we have a question from somebody who's wondering if we could have a look at the content of the imported file. Okay, so um, I was going to actually just show you one piece of it in a second here. Great. So when I click on the instance, actually, let me click on edit real quick here. What you'll find is because the source is Mark, I cannot edit much of this record. So I can't do anything to the title. It won't let me type or, or delete or anything. There are a few bits of the record that are not Mark, like the statistical code that I could update if I wanted to. Music scores is probably not great for reptiles, but let's call it books. And if I wanna see a, a representation of the underlying Mark, I can also click the title and hit the view source here. And that's gonna show me um, a human uh, appropriate version of the MARC record that's living in source record storage, which is broken up into JSON. And I'll go back to the JSON in just a second. So it looks very much like what we saw on MARC edit. Um, here's my 935 with the purchase order number. And at the bottom here is my 999 field, which has been added to the record. This 999 field has the folio, we call them UUIDs, the unique identifiers for the source record in subfield S and for the corresponding instance record in subfield I. And once we have MarkCat completely connected, you'll also see a subfield M for the MarkCat um, version of the Mark record as well. So this is uh, the human readable version of the underlying JSON. This is the uh, source record storage version of the MARC JSON. So this is the, uh, the individual records that were loaded. 
Um, right now, this is as close as you can get to seeing the entire job log, but this will continue to expand as we continue to build out the, the import log details. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. I will show you just very quickly. So I can turn this over to Magda. A lot of this work is set up in the settings area in data import. Um, you can say what the file extensions are that you want to allow or disallow and do those file uh, extensions represent mark files, delimited files, edifact files, or multiples of those. To me, the, the most helpful part of this is being able to block some types of imports. So like MRK, the, the broken apart, iReadable version of the, of the um, mark edit file, I, I don't want to accidentally import that. So if I tried to, um, because it has an MRK extension, it would be blocked and it wouldn't let me upload it. And then these profile areas are where you can put together the matches, actions, and field mappings to create the job profiles. So this part, the, the job profile details, we are still in the process of building out. You'll soon see it in this overview section. The match profiles is getting uh, pretty much com uh, complete, but we are, are we showing you the whole thing yet? I think we're not showing you the whole thing quite yet, but it's gonna be able to say what type of record am I trying to match to and what is the data element that I'm trying to match on. And then the action profiles are telling you, am I trying to create, combine, modify, or replace a particular type of record? And then what type of record am I trying to act on? And the last piece that we're building uh, in terms of the profiles is the field mapping profiles for each type of record um, for a particular data element. Am I grabbing it from a particular field in the incoming record? Am I filling it in with a default? Am I ticking a checkbox? all those bits that go into the mapping part of it. So that's where we stand with data import right now. Um, we are uh, deep into all of the work on the profiles. We expect that we will have um, pretty much all of the work done by the end of Q4, except for the details of the field mapping profiles where we have to do each record type a, a very specialized screen. Um, so we're, we're finishing off the last bits of connecting jobs, matches, and actions right now. So I think that's it for me for data import. And Magda, like I said, is, is uh, getting underway with data export. So I've had probably a year and a half lead time on her. Um, but I'm going to turn this over so Magda can give you a, an update on where things are with data export. I wish I have so much to show as you do. Um, hopefully next time when we meet, <laughs> I'll be able to um, show some alive uh, data export, which is not the case yet. Uh, let me share my screen. We are at the very early stage of the metadata export uh, project. Uh, the subgroup has been created or formed at the end of August 2019, just a few months ago, and uh, has includes imp uh, representatives from uh, several universities, uh, Cornell, Duke, five colleges represented by Mount Holyoke College and UMass, University of Chicago. Uh, Gemeinsamer Bibliotheksverband Centrale in Göttingen and Leibniz uh, Informationszentrum Wirtschaft in Kiel. We meet every week on Thursdays. <laughs> As you see, um, here are the links to our subgroup uh, wiki page and Google Drive. 
and we also have a Slack uh, channel. It's not very active yet. I hope this will change in the next coming months. So how we started? We started with uh, identifying why and how libraries export their metadata. We, uh, brainst we had a few brainstorm sessions uh, creating mind maps and flowcharts. All of them are accessible in our Google Drive if someone is interested. We also reviewed um, and prioritized 19 use cases. Based on those um, sessions, we came up with following priorities. We will start with the functionality that is required for integration with external systems. Let me minimize this. Um, we will start with MARC uh, as an output format. We will be starting again with uh, inventory instance export and we uh, have an assumption that we have a, we are provided with the list of record identifiers for the export here is uh, an example of a sample uh, of here's an example of a simple um, workflow that we would like to start with um, let's assume we would like to uh, export inventory instance in the MARC format. Once we identified the records uh, for the export, we will check every record if it has underlying MARC uh, source record. And if it doesn't, we will generate it on the fly uh, using a default instance to map mapping rules. Once we have all uh, instance record in MARC representation, we will do the required transformation if needed. Uh, determine, uh, we will determine which fields uh, we need to include, suppress or overwrite in our export. This will be a part of the mapping profile. After that, we will determine uh, what is the destination, preferred delivery mechanism and schedule. Once all those elements are in place, we will do the export. As, uh, uh, in order to achieve this functionality, uh, the group has identified uh, following feature features. Um, there are a little bit more than five, of course. The five uh, are um, reviewed and prioritized. They can be worked in a concurrent way, assuming we will have uh, development resources available. We will start with generating MARC bibliographic record for those records that don't have underlying uh, source record. Then we will concentrate on exporting uh, inventory instance. Uh, the same workflow will be for um, holdings um, records. First, generate a uh, mark holdings record uh, for those that don't for those records that don't have it, and then follow with exporting. The last uh, piece is the export of inventory items. We still need to review um, functionality of mapping profile, job profile, and export manager where all those pieces will come uh, in place. The last feature that is on our list is uh, determine how are we going to identify the records for the export. So what is what are the next steps? Uh, we will be meeting with developers to determine um, details of the implementation. Then developers will build and community will verify. Since we will be working in the iterate, inter, iterative mode, this will happen uh, several times. That's it, uh, what I prepared for today. If you have any questions, please let us know.
Thank you, Anne-Marie, and thank you, Magda. We do have one question already that is for Anne-Marie because it's specifically about import, but it might actually apply to export as well, now that I'm thinking about it. And that is, will any of the import profiles and roles be provided as defaults, or should they be crafted from scratch or imported every time the system is installed? Oh, good question. Um, uh, we we haven't talked we haven't had a request yet to have um, kind of default profiles. Um, we do have one that we keep calling the secret button that is basically just creating source record mark bibs and creating the related instances based on the default map. The default map will definitely be part um, and. Uh, if it makes sense to have some kind of canned profiles, then that's definitely something we could could look at. We, we have all kinds of sample profiles right now. We haven't talked about uh, sending out canned ones yet uh, or default ones, but definitely if that's of interest, something that we can, can put on our list. I can see how that would be really helpful to have a couple of canned mm -hmm. examples Yep, and then just be able to edit them to uh, fix the mappings maybe for your order record or something like that. Yeah. Yep, it's always nice to know, you know, to sort of have an example of what you might be able to do. Good idea. And to say about the export, the answer is yes. <laughs> we will have the for default. Uh, the first will be very generic assuming we uh, are getting the whole record, everything what it is, uh, this will be the first attempt of export, but we will try to uh, work on some uh, more granular mappings. There is a question in chat also um, about will there be import and export of user data? Ah, okay. So Magda and I are responsible for basically bibliographic metadata, so acquisitions and cataloging data. Um, there, I I know very little about the the user management app, um, but my understanding is that there is a way that you can import user data. Um, uh, Patty Waninger is the um, product owner for users. So better addressed in the user management Slack channel or to her. But I know there are ways that people are getting hunks of, of uh, user data into Folio. I also think that with our work on the metadata export and import, import and export, uh, we are building the infrastructure for other imports and exports uh, for right. the other records. Right, that's true. I know the, the pub sub functionality that the data import developers are creating uh, is expected to be used uh, in a lot of places in Folio where different apps have to talk to each other. I do know that with user data you have more privacy concerns than with bibliographic data. Um, yeah, but and, I'm, yeah, I made a and, note to myself that maybe we need a forum in the future on import right. export of user data. Right, and definitely th there's a lot of, uh, usually that's integrated with a, a university um, identity system of some kind as well. So you're, you're uh, synchronizing with that pretty often. If there are other questions from attendees, please put them in either chat or the Q&A. While we're waiting to see if there are any, I would just, I was wondering, Magda, if you would talk a little more about how the, specifically the mapping profiles and the job profiles in export, are those pretty much the same as they are for import, but going the other direction? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> they, um, they, we will try while building export um, app based on the functionality that is currently in place in for invent, uh, inventory import. And uh, we also want to preserve some consistency between those application. Um, so we, 
we will uh, try to make them as similar as possible. But as I said, we are still in the process of defining the, um, the, the final uh, version of requirements. So I cannot commit yet. <laughs> right, it's not always as, as simple as just reversing. I, right, you know, right. Because but I we, helped you work on some of that mapping and mapping yeah. out of something back to Mark is very different from market, mapping from Mark into something. Right. I think in terms of look and feel and kind of structure, we, we want to try to reuse as much of the import as we can. But um, some of it's definitely going to need to be different. And there are areas that exist in export and they don't have any meaning in um, in import, like selecting records. And, right. right. Um, so even the layout of the app will need to take into account. Right. Wait just one more minute in case somebody is typing furiously. I'm not seeing any other. Oh, yes, I am. Um, can you say a bit about the flow of information to a discovery system or OPAC? Ah, uh, um, do you want to um, attempt that, Anne Marie? Well, it's okay. it's two, so that's an export. So Magda, do you want to take that one? Uh, <laughs> oh, why don't you? Well, no. I, <laughs> so uh, we had one of the use cases that we discussed in our uh, subgroup meeting, uh, and one uh, the use case that we had was integration uh, with EDS, which is currently done by OAPMH uh, that exports. Um, uh, records f that the harvest records from uh, source record storage and on the EDS uh, RTAC service uh, uh, populates the data that is related to holdings and items. So from the export point of view, the features that we discussed for generating simple mark records for uh, the instance uh, record that don't have underlying source record storage this is what we are going to work first on. Uh, Anne Marie, please add uh, what you think. I no, I think I think that's simplified. it. So so basically, OAI PMH is the the best way to get data out right now that only gets data from source record storage. So for any instances that have um, that don't have a source record storage, that's that's where Magda was talking about, where we need to be able to generate that on the fly. Um, another piece that's important to all of this is um, uh, uh, what we call RTAC, real-time accessibility checking, where uh, there's a call back to inventory to check on holdings and items and what the current CERC status of those items are. Um, so all of that is an important piece for your discovery. And one piece that we're not talking about in this forum, but also is an, a hugely important piece of your discovery will be your e-resource related stuff that you're not necessarily um, uh, storing in your inventory area. And as as Anne Marie mentioned near the beginning, it's it's easy to forget, at least for me, that inventory is not where discovery is coming from. Right. It's a big shift for me, at least in the model of, of how we're managing metadata. I think it's a great shift, but we have to keep reminding ourselves inventory is not discovery. Right. Oh, there's a note from Tom, who I believe is from University of Alabama, yep. that user management has proposed a session at WolfCon that's coming up in January to discuss integration of campus ID systems into user management. So it sounds like that relates directly to at least the import of user data into Folio, if mm -hmm. not the export. So thank you, Tom. And there is a um, implementers group and also a data migration group um, that both have Slack channels. Um, our work gets uh, kind of balled up with their work a lot of times. Um, uh, data import, data export, 
well, data import, I'm not going to speak for export, is not meant to be the way that you get all of your millions of existing bibs and holdings and items into Folio the first time. It's meant to be more the day-to-day -day, uh, loads that you need to do. That said, hopefully there are pieces from data import that can be used to help with the, the initial migration, uh, whether it's the mapping from Mark to instance, or at least getting the bibs in and then doing something maybe different with the holdings and the many, many items. Um, but there's a lot of overlap there. And so those are useful groups on the wiki and in the Slack channels to follow as well. Um, and Guy Dobson's asking about MarkCat. When do I find that in my sandbox? So MarkCat is showing uh, sort of on folio testing snapshot and snapshot load, which means it will be showing on Edelweiss, the uh, Q4 release, which folks should start seeing very end of December, beginning of January. I said showing, I didn't say completely um, usable. And so uh, for the last month or two, the folks that are building MarkCat, which is an Italian group called AtCult, uh, have had it connected, but they're still working on a lot of the um, provisioning and working out bugs and things. It's not incredibly usable yet. Um, so, uh, so you'll be able to see it. I, I don't know how much you'll be able to use it. I'm not the product owner, so I don't want to speak for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure what's in testing right now doesn't have underlying data, so you can't Correct. Yep. do much with it, but you can at least see what the searching is going to look like. Right, and Guy says he'll stick with Mark Edit for now. Um, <laughs> super important, once once Mark Cat is stabilized, uh, will be to get the synchronization between um, source record storage and mark cat happening properly, which will in turn update inventory, and also to get the, the ID handling across inventory, source record storage, and mark cat working properly so that we have a consistent ID, not the UUID, but we've been calling it the human readable ID that can be referred to for, for a record across all the different apps. And and Phil's chimed in and chat that there there is a user import module. Be careful what you say, Phil. We might call on you to <laughs> do a forum. I think that would be a great forum. Noted. Okay. If there are no other questions, um. I would like to thank everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you, Magda and Anne-Marie. And thank you, all, everyone who asked questions and participated in any way, including viewing today's forum on data import and data export in Folio. You can continue this conversation at the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org, or on the many Slack channels, some of which Anne-Marie has been mentioning, or on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the Open Library Foundation's YouTube channel. You can look for it there, though if you registered, you will also get an email with a link to that recording. Thank you very much again. And I'll see you next time we have a forum. <laughs>